there guys, this is SH and welcome to the first episode of my Baldur's Gate Trilogy Let's Play. Yeah, that's right. We're gonna go all three. This is gonna be a very, very long series. <laughs> I, I have no idea how long this is gonna take. This is probably gonna be one of those things that takes like a whole year to do because it is just gonna be something that I come back to every once in a while while things are kind of in a lull while things are kind of just going slow and there's no new games coming out for a little bit or a couple weeks or something like that and this is actually one of my favorite games like ever <laughs> I, I don't know like I spent so much time not necessarily playing through this entire game the whole whole way but playing through the first game mainly I've played through that like a ton now, uh, one of the things that you're going to notice right away is that this is actually a mod. And it's a mod that makes the Baldur's Gate trilogy, that is, Baldur's Gate and Baldur's Gate 2 and Throne of Ball, and even Tales of Sword Coast, so it's almost like a quadrilogy or whatever. But it, it makes it a cohesive experience on the Baldur's Gate 2 engine. So I'm not playing on the original Baldur's Gate engine or anything like that. I'm playing on legit Baldur's Gate 2 engine throughout the whole experience and this is a sweet mod. It takes a long time to get going and everything like that, like, uh, it, it's a pain, but once you get it going, it is freaking awesome. So let's get started. So as you can see, Baldur's Gate 1 and 2 right here, we've got single player, new game. And there's new Baldur's Gate 2 game right over on the other side, if you notice that. So let's see. Um, let's be a guy. And, you know, there is a ton of classes. I'll probably look at a lot of the classes and everything like that. I mean, building a character is is an experience on its own. I mean, if you guys have played D&D, if you guys know anything about anything of d and it's just like you could spend hours and hours just trying to make a character and I think that's what makes it so awesome is because there's so much potential just before you even start the game it's just insane the level of detail that you can put into your character and planning that you can put into your character if you know where things are in the game if you know how things are gonna pan out you can really build a character that suits just specific events in the story and everything like that so if you know anything about D&D, you know that there are a lot of different races. These are actually a small selection. I mean, in the newer rules, newer rules, there's like tons of other races, and uh, and they have like level adjustments and everything like that. I mean, you guys are gonna have to get used to this like right now. If I mean, like if you if you don't uh really like kind of lull moments in action and story development and all that kind of stuff then this isn't gonna be the let's play for you like this is gonna be extremely dirty extremely hardcore extremely awesome <laughs> so uh, yeah so um, there aren't many um, I mean there are but not as many as uh, more of the recent rule addition rules in D&D uh, that there is race statistics there are some like uh, this a human can be any class and they can advance to any level elves can be um, experienced in longsword no matter what class they have but they they might not have like the same class everything see I can I can be any class as this and I can uh, each class kinda has a subclass and everything like that and uh, but these guys can only multi-class humans can only multi-class through in game like actually in the game and how it works is you pick a class and then you level and at one of your next levels you can pick to multi-class into another class and then you stop at that level 100% stop at that level in this game that's how it works you stop at that level when you choose to go into a different class and then all the abilities become locked until you pass that specific level in a different class. And then you get those abilities back. 
So there's lots of strategy involved here already that you, I mean, if you want to build some ultimate character and stuff like that, like say I wanted a mage who was gonna be super sweet at fighting also, then one of the things that I would do is I would go to fighter and I'd probably start the fighting class first so that he is a lot easier to uh, advance earlier on. And then one of the things that I might take into advantage is some of these other classes that don't necessarily have anything, uh, or these other, <laughs> that don't have anything, that have some extra bonuses like um, these bonus to hits and everything like that, or if I wanted uh, some, I don't know, just these extra abilities, I guess, like these enrage abilities, berserkers have enrage and all that kind of stuff. Because when you think about it, if I was going to build a fire mage and everything like that, well, mages can't wear armor when they cast spells. That's that's just how it works. It's not like in any of the later games where uh, you can um, cast spells and there's just a chance that you'll fail that spell. This is like you cannot even do it. That's how hardcore the rules are for this kind of game. So that's just something to take into consideration. And uh, also another thing to take into consideration is that um, pure classes are sometimes the way to go. I mean, being a purist, I mean, sometimes that's not like necessarily fun, but you know, sometimes you just do it. You just got to do it. So I haven't uh, put like a ton of thought into what I wanted to play. Um, I was thinking that I would go wizard though or something. I, I don't know if I, what race I wanted to go either. I mean, it would be sweet to maybe have some of these extra extra things. I, I was going to probably just end up being a pure mage class, though. And I think that that would be pretty sweet because, uh, I mean, you, you have to give to, into the fact that Wizard is a very, very hard starting class. It's going to be pretty brutal early, early on. You're really going to be depending on other characters and all that kind of stuff and I know that this I mean I know that this may seem like rambling and just there's just a ton of information to give people before we even even start the game and there's so much like time to be spent on just making a character and everything like that I mean I'll probably end up just putting an indicator at the top it's like skip skip this entire part if you already know kinda of what's going on because this is probably gonna take a little while and it's just one of those things. I mean, uh, y when you choose different races, people react to you differently. It's that in depth. I mean, you'll just get different. You'll get different options for things if your charisma's like super low or super high, or you'll get different effects on different abilities in some cases, or depending on your alignment, which we'll get into later on, you'll have different special abilities and. All uh, there's just so many different ways to play this game. It's really quite amazing. This game is definitely just like over. I mean, you could spend over 500 hours playing this game over and over again. I mean, you'd know the game by heart by then. But it's just you could start each game as a different character and really have like a totally unique experience each time. So let's see. I was thinking about just going straight up uh, human wizard or something like that, but let's see. It might be nice to be an elf though because you get uh, resistances to charm and sleep magics. Uh, they can see in the dark with infravision. Uh, they they automatically get bow and longsword for weapon proficiencies, which would be kind of sweet to be able to use a bow like as a wizard. Just be like. Poo! What up, sucker? Because <laughs> if I'm just a human, then I have to um, I have to sit there with like a sling, which is just like, yeah, like a slingshot, pretty much. Now, let's see. Half elves. Um, they have limited resistances. Uh, they had. They don't have like the actual. I, I forget what like the disadvantages of being an elf is. I guess there might not really be any. I mean, you get a penalty to Constitution, which wizards will pretty much have a low of anyway. I mean, they're not going to be on the front of battles and anything or anything like that, and uh, doing that would definitely be a bad idea. You're playing it wrong, unless you're going like for Kensai Mage or something like that, which I haven't actually done before. 
So halflings are highly resistant to poisons and magic. They are naturally skilled with slings as weapons, and they have a limited ability to see in the dark. They receive a bonus to their dexterity and incur a penalty to their strength. There are three racial divisions of halflings within the realm. The Harefoot, Tallfellow, and Step. So halflings are basically hobbits, like if you've ever seen Lord of the Rings. Halfling is basically a hobbit. And you should probably know what dwarves are if you don't know what dwarves are. And that's kind of sad. So, uh, let's see. Half-orc? No, half-orc would be dumb. I think that they get incur a penalty to intelligence, which is like our main stat. Because I guess it depends on what you're going for, but it might be sweet to kind of be an elf, maybe. Might look a little weird, but hey. <laughs> or maybe even a halfling. I think that'd be kind of funny, because I mean, if we're going to be using a sling, then we might as well have that extra bonus to having a sling. But, I don't know. It's, it's so hard. It's so hard to decide sometimes. <laughs> They gain a bonus to their intelligence score, so no one would technically be like one of the better races to go. If we are playing like legit, like hardcore, let's perfect a character. But uh we're not. So <laughs> I'm probably just gonna go human. <laughs> I know that's not very un or it's very unimaginative, but hey. Whatevs. So we got all these different kinds of mages here. We got the mage, which is like the general mage. The wizard strives to be a master of magical energy, shaping them and casting them as spells. To do so, studies the strange tongues of and obscure facts that devotes much of his time to magical research. And this is basically just a uh, a general mage that doesn't have any penalties or disabilities or anything like that. Um, but uh, if we did decide to uh, generalize or not generalize, specialize, that's the word I was looking for, specialize. If we decide to specialize, then and the opposing school, if, as you see right here, would uh, be totally negated. We couldn't use it, and so in in uh, essence, we would have to have a, another mage in our party who could use that school. Ideally, the bonuses of having a specialized class is you get an extra spell slot per level. I believe that's how it works. It's an extra spell slot. So you get to be able to cast more spells, but you, you lose spells. And I don't know if I wanted to do that or not. I know that there are items in the game that make it a little easier for you to, to have more spells and everything like that. And I know where some are like right in the beginning. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to be a general mage, I think. So it's not like the most crazy... Uh, <laughs> unique character in the world, but it's going to be pretty tough early on, and that'll be fun. <laughs> I am just playing on normal difficulty and everything like that, too, so, you know, it's not going to be, like, crazy hard. The game is already hard. It already has some pretty difficult things if you haven't, like, played for ever, which I haven't. I mean, it's been, like, two years since I've played, like, the first game and I, I don't think I've ever really completed uh, Throne of Ball. I get really far but or I get like halfway through the game. So if we ever get that far that is going to be pretty sweet because you'll be uh, pretty much along for the ride. I do know what I'm kind of doing for the first game definitely I would say. Um, but we're still going to do lots of stuff, lots of side quests, lots of just it's just going to be playing for fun. We're going to be playing for fun. So here we have the, the alignment uh, the alignment screen here and if you know anything about alignments this is how you pick your starting kind of uh, I guess like good or evil kind of thing if you're good or evil and usually I go chaotic good which is probably what I'm gonna do now because usually I'm kind of a good guy but I make really rash decisions or I make decisions in the moment and you don't really you're, you're not really following the law like the written law. You're following your own law. And that's kind of the character I feel like I am. Um, if you were lawful good, you would be 100% good. This is like paladin status. We're talking like 100% good. You always make the good choices. You always follow the law like the written law of man. Uh, neutral good would be someone who kind of follows the laws most of the time. 
And I, I mean, like these are pretty. These are all pretty uh, unique in their own rights. Uh, your alignment can shift depending on how you play your character, because if you pick something good, then you get good points and everything like that. That's how in depth this game can really get. So we got. There's lawful neutral here. This is kind of switching it up a little bit. Order and organization are paramount importance to the characters of this alignment. They believe in a strong, well-ordered government, whether that government is a tyranny or benevolent democracy. The benefits of organization and regiment outweigh the moral questions raised by their actions. Um, this, I mean, like, some of these things are really brutal. I mean, like, chaotic evil is just like someone like, I don't know, like the Joker or something like that. They don't follow any rules. They're super... They don't like necessarily have any logic to their to their moves. They don't do really anything, and, and they always kind of just like murder and everything like that. Like, see, I mean, if, even if we just read this, these characters are the bane of all that is good and organized. Chaotic, evil characters are motivated by the desire to, for personal gain and pleasure. They see absolutely nothing wrong with taking whatever they want by whatever means possible. And lawful evil characters are kind of funny too because. They believe in like the law and society as long as it is or they believe in it to in using it for themselves pretty much like almost like what it says right here using society and its laws to benefit themselves only like structure and organization elevate those who deserve to rule as well as provide a clearly defined hierarchy between master and servant but we are gonna go with chaotic good chaotic good characters are strong individuals marked by a streak of kindness and benevolence they believe in all the virtues of goodness and right, but they have little use for laws and regulations. They have no use for people who try to push folk around and tell them what to do. Their actions are guided by their own moral compass, although good may not always be in perfect agreement with the rest of society. So basically, if some really difficult decision comes up, we are the kind of characters that make the hard decisions that we think we're doing like the right way. We don't necessarily follow like the law. It'd be like if uh, if some like kid was like stealing food or something like that, and there's a guard there who's like being a total douchebag and trying to to take the kid in and or like kill the kid for some reason or something. It's like do not steal or something like that. Our characters would be those characters that step in and are like, "What the hell are you doing, man? Boom! Fireball to the face! You're dead, sucker!" That's the kind of character <laughs> we are. I mean. Obviously, that's just one kind of um, thing. All right, so now we are at the character generation ability screen, and we are here gonna sit here for a while and probably roll our characters. One easy way to figure out how many points you have is just like minus all these, because I mean you can have a difference in points. So we have like 52 points there. We can store that and just kind of like go through until we get we see some high numbers. So we had 52. So let's hope that we get something higher than 52 this time nope that's 51 I'm not super good at math or anything like that so I mean adding up like all these numbers really fast I mean that's what I just do this real quick and then you see exactly how many so I can recall that number if I wanted to but we're trying to get the best roll we possibly can because stats in this game are very very important I mean you can't even you can't stress that enough so there's 56 that's four more than before this one looks even might be even better but I'll, I'll read through all the stats too probably yeah that's even better store that I don't think it, I don't think we can really do much better than that I'm pretty sure you can get over 60 maybe but uh, I mean, you're really going to be sitting here for a while if that's how it's going to go. Ooh, this one looked, looks pretty good. I'm trying to get the higher numbers in the ones where my stats can be super low. I guess that's everything but intelligence. We want super high ones there. That's even higher. Okay, we could probably just use this one. And so... Strength measures the character's muscle, endurance, and stamina. It is the prime requisite of fighters. We're not a fighter. But this also affects carrying weight. So we want something like in the ten, tenor region, or else we won't be able to carry anything. Like way later in the game, we'll get like these bags called bags of holding, and you can put tons of crap in there. But right now, that's not the case. Not for a long time. 
Now dexterity is actually really useful too because it is what is going to affect my rolls on like slings and stuff like that. So if I'm sitting there throwing slings from back behind uh, my other characters, then this is going to be the, the roll that affects it. So 10 is like a neutral though. So I get like a plus zero, but if I had 12, then I'd have plus one. If I had 14, it's plus two. And 16 is plus three, so on and so forth. But this also affects your armor class, your natural armor class. And we want that to be high. Because wizards don't have armor. So as nimble as they can be. Now constitution, this one's always um really tough for me because it's really just... I mean, if you're playing your character right, you should have tons of resistances and tons of uh, magic spells that help you with uh, alleviating damage and uh, avoiding damage, and just strategic placement of your character will help with that too. So I'm probably going to just keep it pretty low. I mean, it's, it's really risky, but what we want to look at is the, the next kind of stuff and see kind of what we can do with that. So as we can see right here, I just maxed out intelligence. Intelligence is the prime requisite of a mage. I get more spells this way. My spell rolls will be higher. It's it's a no-brainer. You have to you want to max that out. It's you'd be stupid not to pretty much. Now, wisdom is judgment and common sense. Usually I like my character to have at least like 12 or 14 or something like that. And we got Charisma here, which is um, your character's good looks, pretty much. Persuasiveness, ability to lead. If you don't have a high enough Charisma, sometimes characters don't agree with you. Um, actually, I mean, lots of stuff factors into that, like your, your uh, alignment and all that kind of stuff. It's really quite in-depth. And some certain situations, um, even just having uh, companions in your group, that disagree with each other. Eventually they might just kill each other or they, they just like that's the last straw they just go head to head with each other. Now what I might want to do is actually add up to more 12 of that maybe 16 wisdom and have a 1. 1 doesn't necessarily help. Um, and this isn't necessarily the max. There are magical means of kind of increasing these via tomes but there's usually only like one or two for each stat in a playthrough. But you can go through multiple playthroughs with the same character, which is always fun too. So let's see. I'm trying to think of what is going to be the most beneficial. Maybe just having the point in Constitution or maybe trying to max out Wisdom or something like that. Um, I mean, I don't necessarily need the, the Wisdom as much as I might need the Dexterity. So I might just do that. And then put the spare point into charisma because hey, why not? <laughs> I don't know if one point of strength actually influences weight, as I it might need to be two. But I think this is a pretty solid roll. It's not perfect. It's definitely not perfect, but it definitely has the stats that we are kind of seeking. I mean, ideally we would want this to be probably like 14 or 16 or something like that because. May just have so little health in the very beginning of the game, and later in the game too. It's just, it's pretty ridiculous. Actually, yeah, I might want to, man, put down the wisdom, put up the constitution, put that spare point back into that. All right, this is probably a, a lot better actually, because we don't necessarily need the wisdom as much as we would need, say, um, the constitution. But one of those things that you have to be aware of is if I ever wanted to multi-class into a class, the my my stat that I would need for that would have to be at a specific point. Like it would have to be a like if I wanted to do thief, I would have to have like 14 in this or something like that. So if I wanted to be like a multi-class into like a cleric or something like that, then this this would have to be way higher. But I don't really foresee myself multi-classing. I would kind of want to keep my character like as just like an awesome mage guy. I think that that would be kind of cool because I mean there are mages in the game, but I think that playing a mage also gives you the most um, like challenge and at the very beginning especially, and it also gives you like a more unique experience. I feel like 
So, there's that. So, let's do this. We got, uh... Oh yeah, we can throw darts too. But, sling is usually a better a better thing to go because there's ammo um, holding areas and you can just put that kind of stuff in there. Put quarter staff. We are going to suck so hard. Oh man, it's going to be bad. Alright, we get some spells now. And remember, this is the um, Boulder's Gate Trilogy, so we get access to Boulder's Gate 2 spells in Boulder's Gate 1, which makes for uh, definitely more uh, rounded experience, I would say. So definitely want Magic Missile and Identify. Those are two, like I would say, very critical spells. Magic Missile gets better over time. I mean, all these spells get better over time, but in terms of damage, definitely. Over time gets a lot better. Um, we might want the find familiar because if we get a familiar in the beginning, um, let's see, chaotic good gets a fairy dragon, armor class four, hit points twenty four, can cast mirror image and visibility in a ten radius, ten feet radius. Sounds cool. <laughs> Rabbit. They're like, uh, there's a cat. <laughs> uh, rabbit, imp, ferret, suedo dragon. Alright, let's see. Alright, well, armor. Let's see. Armor, by means of spell, the wizard creates a magical field of force that serves as if it were scale mail armor, which would be re is really useful early on. Also, this doesn't limit us. Ver I mean, like, we could find scrolls and stuff in the game and we can add them to our mage book and then like you know we could switch out spells that's one of the great things about being a wizard instead of a sorcerer a sorcerer picks their spells and they have more casts but they have so few spells they only have like uh, four or five spells per like level and then like one or two like way late in the game for like the later spells but they can cast them a lot more than someone else might be able to but this way we can kind of identify the situation and kind of uh, pick our spells accordingly and it just it just makes it more strategic and everything like that. So you know what? There's probably an armor spell like really early in the game. I'm pretty sure that there is. There's probably a magic missile one too, but you know what? I don't know. So we should probably be picking things that we can't even find in Boulder's Gate 1. So um, protection for petrification might be a good one to pick up. Chromatic Orb is kind of interesting because later on it can be like an insta-death spell. Um, early on it kind of does... Uh, okay, let's see here. At first level the sphere inflicts 1 to 4 damage and blinds the target for one round. At second level the sphere inflicts 1 to 4 damage and inflicts pain upon its victim, which is a uh, overtime bleeding effect I think, or something like that. Uh, 1 to 6 damage and burns the victim. At fourth level the sphere deals 1 to 6 damage and blinds the target for one turn. At 5th level, the sphere deals 1-8 uh, damage and stuns the target for 3 rounds. We might find one of those, though. That's one. That's the thing. Oh, I think that's a uh, wild mage only spell. Or something like that. Sleep would be kind of good, maybe. Um, shield is more for, um, for ranged weapons. But early on, we're not really going to be dealing with a crazy, crazy amount of stuff, I don't think, so... Um, let's see... I think it's Spook. And... Reflected Image, maybe? The image will perform all the actions that the wizard does, so that if any enemies are trying to attack that wizard, they will not know which one is the real one. There is a 50% chance that the attacker will attack the image, and a 50% chance that he will attack the caster. So it's kind of like a half chance at getting something off you. And Protection of Evil is kind of like a... Uh, basically a monster armor bonus. So it's really good. And Friends is kind of a... Um, one of those things that's like, hey, I'll cast this on you and um, I'll... My, um, my outlook on this guy is going to be a lot better. Like I cast it on someone and then I talk to them, their outlook on me is going to be far better than... and I might get different dialogue options and everything like that. Larlock's Minor Drain. 
Oh, that's like a leech life spell. But I think that's pretty good for now. So let's let's make our guy look badass. <laughs> we are nearing the end, and I'm going to end the first video right before this. This video is strictly just character creation. If you stuck it out this long, then you must really love some Boulder Gate because I know how tough that might have been <laughs> to stick through that the whole time. And I I, I mean this this is just gonna be like so much fun. I think. Yeah, I think we're gonna stick with the black. <laughs> like that. Let's look at different hair colors. I'm pretty sure you could change any of this like during the game too. Like I don't think they really care about that. They just like allow you to kind of do whatever. That's kind of <laughs> uh it's the brown. It's probably like the most like the portrait, I guess, if you're if you're trying to go for that. Which sometimes I am. Sometimes it's weird if your portrait looks nothing like a character. I don't think I have any, like, um, I don't think I have any crazy amount of, uh, oh, I might have installed some, some sounds and stuff like that. Like, this was, like, a long time ago, though. You can, uh, all we can go through die. all these sounds. None these are females, though. In this Death to you all! As it should be. I must rest my eyes a while. Oh, such a waste of time this is. Such a waste of time! Your life ends here. I alone belong here. I am so very weary. Yeah. <laughs> Time for a bit of the roof and tumble. I usually pick this one, to be honest. It's more like a dwarf voice, well. but it's so awesome because it's just <laughs> really no good. Survivors needed. Yeah, these Someone's are definitely not hurt. from... If my instructor yeah. could... No one these are from... More worthy. From Boulder Skate 2. Let's do this quick and painful. I like that voice, too. I'll get the job done. No but it's more like a thief voice or something like that. To battle with no regrets. I shall To battle with no regrets. To battle and victory. I will strive to To battle and victory. I will strive to lead responsibly. Alright, let's just go with this. Let's one. do this quick and painful. And the name is Space Hamster, bitch. <laughs> yeah, Space Hamster. This is actually really great because this is the game that Space Hamster comes from, if you don't know anything about the origins of my channel name or anything like that. And uh, I think it would be very, very bad if I didn't have that character, if you guys know what I'm talking about, in my, in my group. So let's start the game. <laughs> Look at these graphics. Yeah! This is a big deal back in the day. Oh no, he kicked out the door! Oh my god. I'm Severok, bitch! <laughs> Evil! Man, animations back in the day are so awesome. I can show you, please, please. Boom! Lights out, bitch. <laughs> oh man, he's buff. Bent just metal gate. Dead face. Pretty sweet, huh, guys? Nestled yeah. atop the cliffs that rise from the Sword Coast, 
The Citadel of Candlekeep houses the finest and most comprehensive collection of writings on the face of Farron. It is an imposing fortress, kept in strict isolation from the intrigues that occasionally plague the rest of the Forgotten Realms. It is secluded, highly regimented, and it is home. Within these hallowed halls of knowledge, your story begins. You have spent most of your twenty years of life within this keep's austere walls, under the tutelage of the sage Gorion. Acting as your father, he has raised you on a thousand tales of heroes and monsters lovers and infidels, battles and tragedies. However, one story was always left untold, that of your true heritage. You have been told that you are an orphan, but your past is largely unknown. Lately, Gorion has been growing distant from you, as if some grave matter weighs heavily on his heart. You have asked about his concerns as gently as possible, but your queries have been in vain. Your sole comfort is the knowledge that he is a wise man, and you know he will tell you when the time is right. Nonetheless, his silence is troubling, and you cannot help but feel that something is terribly wrong. Today, Gorion has appeared more agitated than ever, and now he has uncharacteristically interrupted your chores in the middle of the day. Imparting hurried instructions for you to equip yourself for travel, he has handed you what gold he can spare, but given no clue as to why. Nevertheless, you now stand before the Candlekeep Inn, ready to purchase what you need for an unplanned and unexpected journey. All right. Yeah. <laughs> well, guys, that's going to be it for this first episode, the very first episode of many of Baldur's Gate 2 Trilogy. Or Boulder's Gate Trilogy. Boulder's Gate 2 Trilogy. What am I saying? So, I hope you guys will enjoy the ride as, as much as I hope to, uh... I hope this is worth it. You know, have fun making it. So, take it easy, guys, until the next episode. See you later.